a little spastic attempt. Okay, I admit it, I've had sex. Unlike my parents, who I prefer to believe have had it only three times, they're only being myself, my brother, and my sister after all, I have had sex, real sex, the kind of sex that involves reproductive organs on a number of occasions, and not just with yours truly. I know, shocking. But wait, it gets worse. I've not only had sex with other people, I've had it with imaginary people. <laughs> that Amanda Lakes girl, for instance, I died. <laughs> I died from embarrassment where she ever had to emerge from that butter box. <laughs> and the one in those copper tone ads, she makes me blush like a sunbird. But that's not all. I've also had sex with imaginary creatures, like the griffin, there's a hottie. <laughs> and Medusa with those snakes, a face that could stomp a clot that dig that odd. In addition, I've had sex with inanimate objects, discarded socks, soon to be washed sheets, vacuum cleaners, watermelons. Come to think of it, I think I've had sex with the three basic categories of 21 questions fame, animal, vegetable, mineral. <laughs> I lack only air, fire, and water. <laughs> And yet, before you go thinking I'm really special, consider this. Because I once knew a girl named Patio Furniture. You know, the O, like in Irish names. And she claimed to have had sex with nothing. That's right, Patio supposedly had figured out what so long eluded the Eritarians in their fast. She'd sated herself without partaking. She was the Swami of orgasm, the Yogi of coming, the open sesame of leg spreading. And she was going to teach me. I'd first met Patty my last year at Riverwood when I was going through a self-proclaimed spiritual phase and she was doing everything she could to escape the same. I was a senior and she a freshman, which I'm sure seems strange enough on the surface, but as is often the way with women and men, she seemed far more adult regardless of our chronology. And I seemed far less experienced regardless of the fact she was a virgin. For the record, I was not. I think it was because Patty had grown up in a house of boomers. And not just any boomers, but the kind who went the whole hog, moving from rebel to hippie to born again in three easy steps, while indirectly subjecting their poor child to each. <laughs> By the time I met Patty, the born again phase was well established. Her father, raised a Quaker, had returned to his roots and become a member of a circle, sharing his thoughts with such each week and encouraging Patty to do the same. He was a small man with a thin Quaker Oats beard, and when he wasn't sharing, he spent far too long perched on the toilet, reading in there, she said, the no doubt attempting to free himself of some bullshit. <laughs> After all, his wife, Patty's mother, had left him the year before, becoming a member of the Pretty Good for Girls band and changing her name to Bluebird. Bluebird's <laughs> wife, Mama, that's right, Mama, would hug and pet Patty at length whenever she visited her big hands and bigger breasts rising and falling as her blubbery lips smacked over her bubblicious. Patty didn't like Mama, but she did her best to put up with her. As she said, it was either that or stay at home unable to go to the bathroom, her father using the facilities like a library. <laughs> the reason I tell you all of this is that the circle of friends is important to Patty's story, just as is the Oklahoma's bathroom, the pretty good for girls man, and the earth mother Mama. And since these are all important to her story, they're important for my story. Patty's story of my own having become intertwined for a time. This is the way with lovers, even when they're not having sex. I remember one day I was sitting outside in the smoking area, looking through the window at Patty's modern dance class and her in tights. It was something I did pretty much every day in the smoking area. And in fact, was how I first met Patty. My initial image of her being that of a young girl squatting on her haunches and springing forward so that she flipped over in a leapfrog. I'd just seen the movie Isadora with Vanessa Gretgrave, so the idea of modern dance was exciting to me, as was the image of girls in leotards, even <laughs> one young enough to get me arrested. And yet, now, as I stood out there, three weeks since we'd first spoken, hey, she said through the window, hey, I grunted in reply. I was beginning to wonder if this excitement was a good or bad thing. So bad, in fact, it might make me lose all interest in arty stuff like modern dance, much less sex. The problem was one of absence, or absence to be more precise. Patty was young, but she wasn't stupid. And she was innocent, but she wasn't inexperienced. She was just careful, or so she claimed. I, however, was beginning to think she was holding out. 
As I waited for her to finish her class, smoking my cigarette down to the filter so that I felt it hot against my nail, I watched for some sign of recognition in her eyes, some demure half-glance or sideways smile that would let me know that she was attracted to me. But she remained focused on the mirrors in the studio, looking at her flexing thighs, her clearly defined glutes, her glowering lip. She had a kind of Beethovenian intensity that didn't sit well with Quakerism, and I'm assuming gave her father fits. She was all of 14, but seemed as if she could lead a rampage. That is, if she decided to bother. In her regal way, she looked as if she couldn't care less. Hey, Patty, I mouthed silently, seeing my waving reflection in the glass. She looked over, then glowered all the deeper, and I thought of thunder and lightning and strong hands smashing against keys. The song, A Fifth of <laughs> Beethoven, a disco version of Ode to Victory, was popular then. And as I pictured Patty's red cuticles dancing over ivory, I couldn't help but also see her small breast with their red rimmed nipples against the piano, the black of it, and the strings exposed, her legs bouncing, my tongue darting, take me now, take me. Hi, she said, suddenly standing before me. Oh, hi, I croaked, repositioning my books. How is class? <laughs> she shrugged as if the subject wasn't deserving of words. I need to talk to you. Okay, I said. She gestured with her eyes toward the side of the building, and I realized she meant somewhere else. Lead the way. I followed her around the back of the building where the dance class was held, and across the soccer field, glancing over my shoulder quickly as she continued into the woods. The twigs and pine cones were crunching beneath our feet as we walked, and while I studied her shoulder blades moving beneath her t-shirt, I wondered what it was she wanted to say to me, and why she couldn't have said it in the smoking area and how we were going to make it back in time for our next class. Okay, she said, turning. Under a canopy of needles, Patty's body was covered in mottled light. I thought of a jungle cat, its ribcage rippling as it breathed. Well, she was standing looking at me. Something wrong? I was trying not to stare at her chest. You want to join or something? She told me she didn't like drugs. Mama hadn't gotten her stone when she was 11. <laughs> Say something. I meant it as a joke, but it came out sounding desperate. There's no need to be scared, she said. I'm not scared. I just want to be alone with you. Now? Why not? I was about to say that we had class and that we needed to get back or we'd get in trouble, but I didn't want her thinking I was intimidated by authority. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful out here, she sighed. I heard a mosquito whining in my ear. It makes you want to run naked, doesn't it? I slapped the side of my head. I guess. <laughs> sure it does. You ever do that? Run naked in the woods? I thought for a moment she was trying to trick me, dropping a reference to some oddly named sexual practice with which I wasn't familiar. <laughs> I decided it was safest to nod. Good, she said, because I want to. She pulled her shirt up over her head and tossed it on a branch. Her body was much wider than I'd expected, almost like a piece of paper, except for the dogs of color and triplicate red-brown nipples, shadowed navel, a slight crawl of hair over her waistband, black mole beside it. Well, I reached for my shirt, pausing to look around. Oh, come on. And with that, she disappeared into the brush. I followed, moving a branch to keep from scraping myself, feeling it dra drag against my side regardless, a nail scratching, mocking me in my nakedness. Patty was running, or at least moving as fast as one could in the thick growth. As I crashed after her, I felt more leaves and branches whipping beside me on either side. It was like when the older kids in my neighborhood had dared me to chuck eggs at my neighbor's door, and I'd done it, only to have to dash into the woods at night with them behind me and her screaming bloody murder. And as I remembered it, I laughed, giggling like a girl. Stop. Patty had turned her hand out in front of her. I stepped directly up to it so that her palm was pressed against my slick chest. Feel that, I breathed. My heart was pounding. I can't, she said, looking at my waistband. Not yet. I flinched. I didn't mean. It's okay, she said. I want to. I really want to. But, well, I'm not ready. You're not ready. I'm not ready. <laughs> don't be insulted. I'm not insulted. You just don't know what you're talking about. Don't I? She put her palm back up against my chest. My heart was pounding even harder. Her voice went husky can feel bad. We stood there staring at one another, my chest rising and falling, her own chest glistening, our eyes moist, our lips suddenly together, 
mashed together, like we were trying to bond them together with glue or something, I came. I felt my <laughs> tongue freeze in her mouth. I felt the corners of her own mouth curl in a smile. Then I felt her step back, and I opened my eyes to see her hands approaching my cheeks. Hey, she said, taking my head in her hands. I tried to smile, but it came out like a frown. I want to teach you something. I nodded curtly, assuming she meant how not to come so fast. <laughs> it's something I do a lot. I was listening harder now. More than I should, even harder. Something very satisfying. Yes, I said. I'm afraid I sounded breathless. I come. Yes? Without? Yes? Yes? Touching myself. She took her hands from my face. I nodded again, but more forcefully now, encouraging her to say more, even if I didn't really believe what she was saying. <laughs> Let's go, she said, but more later, not now. And with that, she skipped off down the path, grinning back at me and looking more like a girl of four than 14. She was going to teach me. As I sat in class later that day, holding as still as possible to keep my shirt from brushing against my scrapes, I smiled happily, anticipating what was to come. Would we engage in some sort of hippie sex ritual that would last for hours and involve chanting and incense? <laughs> would we perhaps return to the woods and run together one more time, yet in this case without pants, the branches slapping against us like fists? Or would it be like in that D.H. Lawrence book, the two of us bareback and buck naked, becoming one with the horse? <laughs> or perhaps like in my other favorite book at that time, The Happy Hooker, <laughs> our motorcycle, racing under the moon and the wind whipping our hair and her arms wrapped around me and her pubis pressed against my coccyx. <laughs> they were all possible. And as I left class that day and returned to my house in the suburbs, I thought of them all in more an alteration. The images flashing through my mind like the channels of a remote controlled television, this one, that one, another one, shuffling them like a deck of cards as I lay in bed pretending to nap. The first one, the second one, the fifth one, then the first and fifth and third, back and forth, together and rearranged, faster and faster as my sheet rose and fell, a spastic tent. It got so bad that when my mother knocked calling me to dinner, it was more the huskiness of my voice than anything I said that caused her to leave. Yes, I was in a state, a bad one, a bad moon rising. <laughs> I finally got on the phone and told Patty we should go out Friday night. And when my mother overheard and asked where, I told her nowhere. But I wasn't trying to be rude. I was just thinking that was the place that Patty had promised me, the nowhere of nothing, where together we could both get off. Of course, even if we were going nowhere, we had to meet somewhere first. <laughs> <laughs> so, as Friday night approached, I racked my brain to come up with a place, trying to decide where to take a girl of 14 if you wanted to get into her pants. It couldn't be a bar, I realized, fake ID or no fake ID. That not the sort of spot for the spiritual set. And a movie wasn't likely to be much better. A Hollywood crap that we both disdained, a distraction at the very least, and a turnoff at the worst. There was dinner, of course, but Patty was a dancer, and so thin, I doubted she'd like that. <laughs> all indication, she ate as little as she could, her cheekbones jetting out like the rudders of a ship, and her cuticles scab flecked as if she subsisted on nails. No, I didn't know where to go, but I knew we had to go somewhere, so I thought and I thought. And when I ran into her in the hall the morning of our date, it still hadn't decided. I felt as awkward as Woody Allen. Luckily, that provided me with inspiration. You ever seen an Ingmar Bergman film? She looked up at me slowly, and I realized she was Lee Volman in miniature, albeit a squatter version with dark circles in her eyes and homemade earrings in the style of patio furniture. Maybe. Well, there's one at the Ansley Cinema, the art theater near your house. I know it. I can pick you up at, I thought of her father and stopped. I'll meet you there, she said, as if reading my thoughts. We can go get coffee at the bookstore beforehand. I'll have tea, she said. <laughs> tea then, five o'clock? It sounded early, but I was tired of thinking, and there were too many people going by looking at us, me and this little girl who I did my best not to talk to for long in public. This little girl who up until now had said that she wanted to get to know me and school, that we didn't need to go on a date, that we were fine, just the two of us in our midday smoking area talks. Okay, I said. And with that, I turned to go, wondering why I suddenly felt so nervous. 
The bookstore was called Chapter 11, and it sold remainders <laughs> of everything from the Bible to the classics. It also housed a cleverly named cafe called the Brown Ring, which some people thought was adorable, but I always thought it sounded like shit. <laughs> I saw Patty sitting at the back of the cafe when I arrived that Friday, leaning over a book and biting furiously at her cuticle. She didn't see me, and for a moment I just stood there watching her, marveling at her intensity, the grip of her teeth on her flesh like that of some beast of prey on its kill. She seemed far away, lost in whatever she was reading, or maybe just lost to this world. Yet when she looked up, she put a smile on her face so fast that I wondered which was the real Patty, the one that glowered when went away from me, or the one who smiled when I was around. Hey, I said, taking a seat. What are you reading? She held up the cover for me to see. I loved my body, daily affirmations for the whole person. <laughs> What's that, a sex manual? She frowned. No. Well, what is it? She read. To love your body, you must speak to your body. And to speak to your body, you must use the language of love. I rolled my eyes. I love my hands, she continued. I love my feet. I love my toes. I love my heart. I love my colon. I stifled a laugh. Gesundheit, thanks. You want a coffee? Tea, please. Chamomile. Chamomile it is. I went to the counter and ordered our drinks. When I got back, Patty was glowering at me openly. What's wrong? Diet Coke? It's for me. Here's your tea. I don't care if it's for you. I mean, I care, and you should too. It's your body. I love my body, I did hand. <laughs> <laughs> she glowered even deeper. It made her face look almost like it was turning upside down. It made it twisted as if she were in pain, as if an orgasm. Sorry, I said. Well, if you're going to be spiritual, you shouldn't drink that stuff. You're right. I mean, you talk about wanting to change. I felt something turn inside. I thought for a moment it was the Diet Coke. Why do you always do that? What, she said. Corner me. She looked as if she were considering that. Not surprised, not upset, just considering. I don't mean to, she said. Her voice was husky again. It was a woman's voice, an older woman's voice, almost motherly. I waved my hand as if clearing away smoke. So, you are looking forward to the movie? I've seen it, she said. You've seen it? Yes, it's cries and whispers. I've seen it three times already. Three times? Mm-hmm. What's it about? Oh, what's it not about? <laughs> <laughs> I felt the twisting inside again. Was she patronizing me? I didn't know the word patronizing at that time, but I knew the feeling. <laughs> so, you still want to see it? If you do. I don't know. I mean, if you've seen it. Yes, I've seen it. You should, too, at some point. Later, I did see the film. It's about two sisters who care for a third sister dying from cancer. It is indeed full of cries and whispers, mostly cries, and other things, too, like bile, blood, and intestinal matter, the last of these appearing in a pool of vomit. I can see it later, I said. Okay, she said. So if we're not going to see it, she looked up at me from her book. She was quiet again, her face a mask of stillness, her eyes unmoving, her lips seeming to swell as I watched. I know a place, she said. I could barely hear her. It's near here, she went on. I was leaning over the table, straining to make out the words. In the woods, she said. I heard that. A cemetery I found, an abandoned one. No one knows about it. No one goes there. I was an inch from her face. I could feel the breath from her mouth. I could feel my back straining to reach her. I could feel her hand reaching for mine under the table. Come on. The cemetery was indeed hidden away and abandoned looking, with weeds growing up almost to the top of the graves, and all but two of those fallen over and broken. Strangely enough, it was also within hearing distance of the parking lot to the strip mall containing the bookstore and the movie theater, a kind of pocket of lost time visible to the shoppers as they went in search of underpriced books and art films, not to mention cheap kids' shoes, discounted cakes, and tattoos. I love it here, Patty said, lying down between the two gravestones that remained standing. They looked like bookends encasing her, or maybe a boat, a boat on the river Styx. You know that band Styx? What? <laughs> what, she said? She was blinking up at me, looking far away. I could see the shadow of my head on her chest, elongated and dark against the white cotton of her shirt. You just going to stand there, she said. I shook my head, but didn't move. Here, she said, patting the ground beside her. I won't bite. 
I thought of her gnawing her nail as I heard the motherly tone in her voice. The two didn't fit. I decided she was bluffing and laid down next to her, suddenly calm. That's good, she said. Now look up. She pointed directly above us to a place where the sky was visible through the trees. I saw her red-rimmed fingers, raw, tiny, and reached out to touch them. This first, she said, digging in her pocket. A second later, she fished some, out something red. She shook it, and I was relieved to see it wasn't a condom, but a piece of cloth. <laughs> here, she said, tying one end of it to the gravestone at her feet. And here, she continued, tying the other around the gravestone behind her heads. I looked up again and saw we now had a canopy above us. It was a red canopy, lit faintly by the light, glowing almost like a flush. It went perfectly with the gathering gloom, the crepuscular shimmering, shimmering of pointless dusk. Nice, I said. Yes, it is, isn't it? We lay there for a minute just looking up at the sky, feeling a breeze pass over us, feeling good. I heard myself breathing deeply, very deeply. I felt calm and in control. I felt happy. I turned to tell her. Not yet, she said, holding up her hand. Just relax. I don't know why, but for some reason that made me nervous. <laughs> I'm fine, I said. I know, she said, but you don't want to rush things. All in good time. I felt her hand reach for my own. Okay, she said, clutching it so tight I felt her nails in my palm. Here's what we're going to do. She let go, rising up on one elbow, looking down at me. I'll take my clothes off. I'm afraid I giggled. And you'll take your clothes off. There was that motherly tone again. Interesting, I said. Come on, be serious. Her launcher earring was dangling above me. Serious? Who is she kidding? Okay, I lied. Okay, she said, calmer sounding again. You do that, and I'll do the same, and then I'll show you how to do it. Do it. What was so magical about those words? I don't know, but they were indeed magical. I pulled my shirt up over my head as she did the same. Then I struggled with my boots, my belt, my pants, pausing briefly at the underwear until I saw her pull her own down. I followed suit. My balls felt the breeze. She was looking at me, but not down to where my free hand was strategically positioned. She was looking into my eyes. I was trying to do the same while straining to glimpse what I could of her body and my peripheral vision. I thought I could see a dark place between her legs, tufted, but it could have been a shadow. Now take your free hand and hold it up like this. She held her hand out, palm forward, like she had that first time when we'd gone in the woods. It was like a cop directing a traffic or that robot in the day the earth stood still. Okay, I held my palm out so that it almost touched hers. Now, keep it like that, right there, and follow my hand's movements and sink. She began moving her hand down away from her chest, and I attempted to follow, though as before I became distracted by the sight of her nipples and the slight swell of her chest. Pay attention. I looked at her hand again and did my best to focus. We were heading toward that dark place, the tufted or shadowed one. Suddenly her hand shot quickly up toward her face. Stay with me. Her faces were obscured by her hands and I could only stay with her by peeking through her fingers. I followed as our hands went up high over our heads, almost touching the gravestones. Then as they went out in an angle so that my arm was almost touching her side. Then out in an angle over me so that her arm was almost doing the same then back down toward that shadow place, her thighs, my thighs, her knees. She stopped. There, she said. I felt completely exposed. We weren't moving at all, and our eyes were focused below our belts, or at least where our belts used to be. I squinted, trying not to see myself, my dick hanging out there, moving slightly as I breathed, my chest rising and falling, her hands not moving, her whole body open to me, her legs suddenly spreading, but the hand staying. Don't move. But I was moving on my own, in my own shadowed place, or at least where I wished I had shadows. I was moving up in the world, growing up as it were, becoming a big boy, becoming a man. <laughs> yes, she hissed. I thought I saw something glisten between her legs. I thought I saw something red, but it could have been the reflection of the canopy. I thought I caught a faint whip of something musky, patchouli maybe, or skunk. Don't move. Though she was moving, her legs moving, scissor kicking, pedaling in the air, moving, I clutched her hand and pressed it against my cock. No, come on, no, please, no, no, no. 
Her legs slammed together with our hands between them. I thought for a moment she'd broken it. My hand, that is. I don't know what she did, hers. Great. I'm sorry. You're always fucking sorry. You're sorry, you're sorry. She was mimicking me now, or someone like me. I'd never talked to her like that. I didn't know what was going on. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. A simple instruction. Very simple. You break, you buy. Nice to see, nice to hold, but if it's broken, it is sold. Look, sees, but no feelies. Hands off, hands to yourself. Arms akimbo, daddy-o. All right, I get it. Do you? I didn't know what to say. To any of you? I didn't know what she was talking about, but I felt defensive. You're also stupid. I remembered how I told her I hated the suburbs, how I hated the American dream my parents had attempted to pursue. I wished they were like hers and didn't care about the American dream. I thought maybe she was referring to that. All of you with your needs and your bodies and your desires and your touch this, touch that, just touch it. She wasn't talking about the American dream. I bet your fathers are all the same. I bet all of your fathers are all the same. I thought maybe you were different, but you're the same. I should have listened to my mother. She started to cry. What's wrong? But she was waving me away, standing up, getting dressed while still cursing under her breath, running away down the path before I could get dressed and catch up with her, still crying, I think, the wet streaks on her face, or maybe it was just sweat. She forgot to take the canopy, however, the red one that had been above us, so I untied it from the ends of the gravestones and stuffed it in my pocket, planning to return it next time we met. But dear friends, I must confess something, something I wish weren't true, but is unfortunately, and so must be said. I never returned that red cloth, that canopy, that blushing hoopa of sorts in the woods. I did it because, well, I used it later, when I got home, alone <laughs> in my room. I used it in a way I think you can imagine without me drawing you a picture, in a way that involved close contact and a feeling of warmth. And when I finished, I balled it up and threw it in the trash, where I then put more trash on top to cover it, crumbling page after page of white paper from my spiral notebook till my can was overflowing and my notebook was just two cardboard flats. <laughs> and when I saw Patty again in school the following Monday, I didn't say anything about it and she didn't bother to ask. In fact, she didn't say much of anything, just nodded at me, smiling slightly. It was a sad smile, regardless. A smile I wanted to reach out and touch with my fingers to change it. A smile I wanted to brace, to remold. Her face a soft mask, her flesh a sculptor's clay, my hand having the ability to touch her and touch her deeply. But I kept my hands to myself. I merely smiled back, a little sadly, and then I walked away. Thank <laughs> you.